if you are going to produce a podcast as an organization of any kind, it needs to be at the level of quality of the rest of your communications. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're doing yourself a disservice. Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. I'm your host, Jody Krangle, and this podcast will discuss just how sound influences our behavior. I generally talk about this in the context of advertising and marketing, but there are other places this is important too. I really feel that it plays a much more important role in our lives than maybe we realize. So let's delve a little deeper. This is the first part of my interview with Elaine Appleton Grant. My next guest is a writer, podcast producer, and public speaker. She co-founded Podcast Allies, LLC, a podcast consultancy and production studio in Colorado. She's reported, produced, or hosted programs at Boston's WBUR, New Hampshire Public Radio, and Colorado Public Radio, and her work has appeared on NPR. She produces Business Wars Daily, a Wondery podcast about corporate rivalries, and One More Shot, a podcast about reinvention. Her name is Elaine Appleton Grant. You can probably find her most easily on LinkedIn under the handle Appleton Grant. And if you're interested in the world of podcasting, this is definitely going to be a helpful listen. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Elaine. I really appreciate your being here. I'm very excited to be on your show, Jody. It's a great <laughs> show. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. So I have to ask, because of all this stuff that's going on, how are you doing? <laughs> like, are you okay? Are, you know, you hanging in there? <laughs> you know, I think, I think my experience is probably very common, which is that I have great days. And to be honest, I have pretty anxious days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's to be expected. I mean, I'm very fortunate because... My work has continued. My business, my business partner is fine. My life partner, his work has continued. And we mostly worked out of the house anyway. Um, and so I feel pretty privileged. Um, but, you know, I'm anxious about family and friends. And I have even more work than I did before. Wow. <laughs> which, okay. Yeah. Now, that does not mean that I have more clients. It means that my <laughs> schedule has changed yeah, because yeah. the news cycle has gotten faster. Totally. So, you know, that's that's been challenging. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, for the most part, I'm pretty um, I'm fine and I'm, you know, embarrassingly fine. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. You well, know, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to yeah. hear that. Yeah. I'm, how about I'm, you? How about you? I'm kind of in the same position you are, actually. I have good and bad days of anxiousness, but at the same time, I'm still I've always worked from home. So for me, this is just, you know, another Monday, <laughs> really. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I want to ask you so that we can get into the actual, you know, reason for the podcast. Um, what's your background in producing podcasts? I mean, how did you get interested in this in the first place? I was thinking about this question earlier and uh, very fond memories, actually, because mm -hmm. I was around audio my entire life. Wow. And I never really give this much thought. But when I was growing up, my father had a small advertising agency and he made radio spots way oh. back when. Mm -hmm. and uh, and then TV commercials. And I remember, do you remember the chain Papa Gino's? It, you might not uh, in Canada. It's a big pizza yeah, chain. Yeah, maybe not here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was like eight years old, I was in a Papa Gino's commercial. And I remember, <laughs> yeah. And I remember too, you know, we had, you know, the traditional 1970s basement playroom with the indoor outdoor carpet. And I mm -hmm. remember him bringing in a little band to play the jingle and recording it in our, uh, God, it, I might even remember the song, uh, but I won't sing it for you because it's not pretty. Um, but uh, I remember him recording that band in our basement. It was so exciting. And, wow. Yeah. And he was a professional photographer as well. And the we had a dark room, but the dark room was also a sound studio. Real to real oh, okay. recorders. Oh, yeah. You know, 
And and he was a writer. I'm a writer. And um, and I spent a lot of time acting. That was what I really wanted to do growing up mm-hmm. and love theater. And so I think it was just in me from day one. And uh, I spent my first 20 years of my career as a magazine editor and writer, but I always loved public radio. Mm. And I got my first opportunity to do public radio in 2003 um, at Boston's WBUR station Mm -hmm. as an associate producer, which was a great learning environment and so exciting. And then got another opportunity in 2008 to go work as a reporter at New Hampshire Public Radio. And I, you know, I, you, I don't know if it's ADHD or I just like to learn, but after a while of just producing stories, I shouldn't say just, it was a fantastic opportunity mm-hmm. and being on the air that way. We had two interview programs and I raised my hand and, and said, you know, if you ever need a fill in and they took me up on it. So I started filling in as a host okay. on the exchange, yeah. which is still on the air and word of mouth. And, uh, and it was great. I just loved it. And, you know, love great interviews. Total, total NPR junkie. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then I came to Colorado and ran an interview program. And when I left there, which was five years ago this month, the podcast industry, I mean, obviously had been around for quite some time. Mm Mm-hmm. But it seemed new to most people. Yeah. That was still when people were like, what's a podcast? You know? Yeah. And I started, you know, pitching podcasts and I got some fantastic opportunities. And it was just, I love the intimacy of it and the flexibility of it. And there's so many more opportunities to do great storytelling and podcasting than frankly there are in radio because you're you're hamstrung by time limits not that's not to diss radio at all i still love it Mm -hmm. yeah but it's been it's been a wild ride for the last five years Mm -hmm. why would a podcaster start podcasting now or why would a why would a company start podcasting now especially now actually like do you think that there's a, a place for new podcasts right now I think there is, actually. And uh, I think it's a really interesting and challenging time in podcasting. Mm -hmm. Um, What I have seen, I've seen a few things. One is the numbers just keep growing. I think Apple Podcasts hit a million like this weekend. Yeah, just recently. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, you know, you're getting to a core philosophy of mine, Jody, which is... (laughs) That not everybody should do a podcast, you know? You shouldn't do a podcast just because it's the thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. So why should you? (laughs) (laughs) Let me answer your first question first. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'll try it anyway. Okay. Um, So what I have seen is a real mixed bag strategically. So we have one client at Podcast Allies, uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, who we've been working with for a long time. Mm-hmm. to launch a new podcast for young climate leaders, people who want to use their careers to help solve the climate problem in one way or another. And they were just about to launch. And they said, whoa, we've got a delay because it would be tone deaf right now. We still believe in this, but there's so mm-hmm. much going on with the job market, with our particular audience. We just don't feel it's the right time. So we're going to delay, hopefully, by just a couple of months. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think that that was the right decision. On the other hand, there's another division at EDF that is launching a podcast as fast as they can for a very tiny but very valuable audience. And that is policymakers and lawmakers who they usually visit on Capitol Hill and now they can't. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so they want to get their messages of urgent policy out to that particular audience Mm -hmm. while they can't do it in person. And Zoom calls aren't going to work because these people are busy. They're not going to necessarily take them. Yeah. And, you know, you can reach more people and so forth. But it's a really it's a really tiny, but it's a really valuable audience. It's so incredibly smart. Mm hmm. 
And so what I'm seeing and I believe is out there, I, I've been thinking, gosh, I should go, you know, do a lot of interviews and do an article about this and find mm-hmm. out how widespread this is, is that people, especially organizations, are finding that podcasting can replace what we had before in terms of communication with very particular kinds of audiences, like their employees, obviously customers, shareholders, you know, if you're an association or if you're an association, your members. We have another association that we work with, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they are hopefully, they're waiting to see if they get a grant. Mm Mm-hmm. Going there, they have sixty-eight thousand members who are pediatricians and nurse practitioners, and you know, pediatric pediatric health providers, mm-hmm. and they want to urgently start a podcast, which is not the one that we started working on with them, um, to provide COVID information, urgently mm-hmm. needed COVID information that you can get easily, as opposed to like finding the time. Who, what doctor has the time right now to go read academic journal articles? Yeah. Exactly. They, they don't have time. Mm-hmm. And so so I think that there are a lot of really strategic uses for podcasts. And that's true for, you know, solopreneurs and individuals as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but my belief is you should be strategic no matter what. It's just that you have to be more strategic now and you've got to be really careful about being tone deaf. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you found I mean, the same thing. Well, I have, and it's an interesting um, it's an interesting study, I guess, for me because I do these interviews months in advance before they actually come out. So, the ones that I've just recently done that have just come out really haven't mentioned the the pandemic at all because we weren't it wasn't even on our radar. <laughs> That's right, and it, actually, it's a relief to listen to those, <laughs> right? Because I, I, yeah. We're, inundated. Yeah. The the later ones will mention, you know, like we had a short conversation about how we're doing now, you know, like that's, that's going to be part of the ones that are coming up. But what I tend to do when I release these is I mention, you know, basically, I know that you're all at home. I know that you're all, you know, busy or not busy, depending on what you're doing or not doing. (laughs) Um, And maybe this will be a nice distraction, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I mention it in my social media posts and, and when I post it places, I, you know, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on, but um, the podcast itself doesn't reflect it just yet. Um, I think the next one doesn't, um, the next, I think the next three almost, uh, yeah, the next three, I don't think even mention it. And mm-hmm. then it gets into it. Then after that, you start... <laughs> But, you know, that's like almost two months later. So who knows wow. what we'll be looking like in like June? I have no idea. Now, why are you why are you quite so far out two months? out? Well, I do these uh, podcasts in um, uh, two sections. So if mm-hmm. I do an interview, it's usually a part one and a part two. Mm-hmm. And I do that for my own sanity <laughs> um, so that I can program it out a bit far. Um, in between, I have a solo episode that's going to come out this Wednesday that actually does talk about it and, you know, why audio branding is important even now. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll mention that we're in the middle of a pandemic and there is something going on. So I'm aware, but, you know, the previous interviews that I did, I certainly don't want to trash them because they are great interviews, you know. Um, when I promote them, I will promote them with uh, an, uh, you know, an ear towards what's going on out there now. And that's really all I can do. And yeah. people are either going to be interested or not interested. <laughs> I have to leave it at that. Well, you know, I'm I'm definitely seeing this is that, you know, it's a question between, it's a really fine line. It's like, are people sick of hearing about it? Or is this our reality? And so we have to talk about it. Um, so I produce a daily I write and produce a daily podcast called yeah, Business that's... Wars Daily, you know, which mm-hmm. is for Wondery, which is, you know, the network of Business Wars and Dr. Death and Dirty John mm-hmm. and so forth. And um, I believe I just finished like number 430. Wow. Yeah. And I used to be able to write five episodes in a week 
and have a weekly deadline. And then they would be released the following week because we're not breaking news. We're news analysis and sure. entertaining news analysis. It's supposed mm-hmm. to be fun. Yeah. Well, as soon as coronavirus hit, that was no longer possible because what I could write one day was wrong the next in two days, maybe. And even still, you know, so what we've done is uh, immediately when coronavirus hit, I got together with the team, which is my wonderful, wonderful editor, Emma Cortland, and equally amazing host, David Brown. And we um, had a conference call. <laughs> it was supposed to be a Zoom call. Nobody, mm-hmm. we're all audio people. Nobody wanted to be on camera. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, like none of us are putting our makeup on or, you know, brushing our hair or wearing exactly. pants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we all got together and we said, all right, what's our strategy now? And uh, and so originally we, we decided, well, first of all, it all has to, it's business. So it's all going to relate to coronavirus because it's thrown the entire business world up and, you know, crazy. Of course. Yeah. And. And I came up with this, what I thought was going to be a brilliant schedule. Okay, we're going to do uh, basically produce three days a week. And two of those days, I would write two stories for the next couple of days. Immediately, it didn't work. How come? Have to do it every day. Why is that? The news is changing way too fast. Ah, so quick. Yeah. Way too fast. So now Mm -hmm. I'm on a daily deadline. And... um, that's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. It's, it's <laughs> you know, I can't say that I enjoy it that much. Mm-hmm. It's it's back to doing daily news, like on, you know, public radio. Mm-hmm. Um, but because it's analysis, it's a lot of work. Uh, however, I think we're doing great work. And yeah. that's been cool. The other thing that I've been more conscious of, um, and it's a really interesting thing because you mentioned you're doing a solo episode next week Mm -hmm. yeah so this is a solo hosted scripted podcast so david brown is voicing these scripts that i write Mm -hmm. so for gosh going on two years now it's just been a solo hosted news podcast well we just got an email address for business wars daily and now we're doing call outs to listeners to say, how has this affected you for good or ill? Because some businesses are booming, as we know, mm-hmm. and most are, you know, struggling. And what do you want us to cover? And so we're starting to get emails from people with, you know, really good questions and, you know, some kind of heart wrenching stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Today's episode comes directly from a listener's story where he's, you know, managing partner of a nightclub in. Um, oh, that's tough right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In Disneyland. And in oh, Disney double Resort whammy. Just double whammy. <laughs> well, of course, it would have wouldn't have mattered if Disney was well, closed. They have to exactly. Be closed. Yeah. You know, wanting to know, like, basically take the pulse of the of the nightclub industry. Mm-hmm. And and it's very interesting to me to say, oh, my gosh, you know, there is a good way to add interactivity to a solo hosted podcast. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I have um, a form that people can fill out to write to me um, mm-hmm. on my podcast page. It's just at this point, <laughs> there's not a lot of people writing. <laughs> It's fairly early on. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think the idea of calling out your your listeners is fantastic. You know, make them uh, feel like they're actually involved in what's going on. I think that's great. Yeah, exactly. And give them a sense of ownership. Exactly. To, to the podcast. So it's it's an interesting time to be sure. It's more work, but I do think that the, the quality is a notch up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Cool. Um, so you have mentioned um, that you have a process for helping people create podcasts, right? And just to to kind of go back to the, the whole creation thing, <laughs> um, what questions do you ask people who want to create a podcast? You know, this sort of goes back to when I said I don't think that everybody should do a podcast just for And this. it's a good point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it also goes back to something that you said, I think. I think on your part one interview with Steve Keller of Pandora, mm-hmm. where you said, you know, 
organizations pay so much attention to their branding, their fonts, their colors, their online messages, their videos, Mm -hmm. and they ignore the audio. Yeah, totally. Right. And uh, which is something I say to clients all the time and potential clients is that if you are going to produce a podcast as an organization of any kind, it needs to be at the level of quality of the rest of your communications. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're doing yourself a disservice. And people just still don't realize it. I think that the, I think it's changing pretty rapidly. Yeah. But, you know, I I think they don't realize it. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So to, to your, to your question of what questions do we ask, Mm -hmm. um, we, and I I say we, because I, I co-founded Podcast Allies with my wonderful business partner, Lindsay Mm O'Connor. Um, our first question is, it's not necessarily in this order. My favorite first question is why, Mm -hmm. right? Why do you want to do this? Are you trying to promote your business? Are you trying to build a community? Do you have a problem you're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have a driving question that you could ask every single episode and get a different answer? So like in your case, I don't, you probably don't use this terminology because it's our terminology, the driving question. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Um, But it would be, you know, something like how can audio branding serve your interests or, or something like that? I mean, yeah, I, I. I ask that question pretty much of everyone that I interview. Yeah. Or how can audio branding help other people uh, get their message across in a deeper way? Much better than I. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, I'm, right. But yeah, I mean, but I do ask that question of every person that I have on the show. And and I, like you said, I get a different answer every time. And that to me is fascinating. <laughs> exactly. And it, and it serves as sort of the umbrella for everything you're doing. And so, mm-hmm. so... Why is so important? You know, you wouldn't put out other kinds of communications without having a strategy for it, having a purpose. Um, Mm -hmm. For instance, if what you really want to do is promote your products, go buy an ad or buy ads on other people's podcasts because nobody wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. And or if you just want to do it because you think it's cool. I worked with a nonprofit that will remain nameless a few years ago (laughs) that wasn't able it's, this is hard because it's exactly getting to what is your message for your organization in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. If you can't articulate that, then it's going to be pretty hard to articulate it for a podcast. And so I worked with this organization that just wanted a podcast and they had great guests coming through town. They had Contacts like you would not believe. I mean, mm-hmm. at one time I interviewed both the governor of Colorado and the U.S. ambassador uh, from Colombia wow. at the same time. Right. <laughs> Very sparkling, like, oh, shiny object. Mm-hmm. But what do you want to get out of that interview? Right. They really couldn't articulate it. And so it didn't last and it didn't get an audience and they didn't promote it well and and so forth. So I'm not trying to be a naysayer here. I'm trying to say you can do a fantastic podcast if you know your purpose. Yes. And you, you know, and you're strategic yeah. about it. So mm-hmm. so we work a lot with people on that. Um, what do you have to say that matters? You know, a great host knows their subject, just like you know your subject really well, right? I think like I mentioned a, this on another podcast. I am not the expert here. I have just played one on TV. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's that. I, I just, yeah, I, I interview a lot of very knowledgeable people and I pick up a lot of what they're saying to me. So in that sense, yeah, I guess I know a lot about my topic, um, you know, 
coming from the position that I do as, as a voice actor, I, I deal with that branding all the time. But yeah, there are so many nuances of this that I would never know if I hadn't asked questions. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, that's another reason to do a podcast, actually, is is for your I own. I want to learn. You want to learn. Yeah. And it yeah. comes across. It comes across that you want to learn. And I think that's a mark of a good host, too, is you want to learn. You don't need to know it all, but yeah. you need to know enough so that you're asking good questions. You know, you're mm-hmm. coming from a... Yeah. I used to call it, to me, the perfect host is someone who is serving as a guide for the listener. Yes. You know? Yeah. You're saying the curiosity that your audience might want to have answered. You know, you're asking questions that your audience would want answered, put it that way. (laughs) I think so. And you're leading the guest in that direction. Mm -hmm. And you're not asking questions that anybody could find if they just looked up the person on Google or whatever, you know, you're coming to it with a lot of research and knowledge of that guest mm-hmm. and, and so forth. Um, so, so it's, what do you have to say that matters? What are you passionate about perhaps? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third one is kind of obvious. It's to whom, who is your audience? So you have mm-hmm. a very clear audience. Um, I have a, a good friend who has a podcast called The Selfish Latina. <laughs> Isn't, that that. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Yeah. And she has the most amazing audience. She's actually shopping that podcast to a very big network right now. And I think it's looking good, but I can't mention it. Good for her. So crossing yeah. my fingers. I'll keep my fingers crossed for her. Yeah. yeah. So she has the most amazing audience because it's niche. It's Latinas. Mm-hmm. But it's a particular kind of Latina. It is what she calls Enyes which is a term for people who were born in America, but who have at least one parent from a Spanish-speaking country. Mm -hmm. And so she made a film. Her name is Denise Soler Cox. I'm going to call her out. Um, Sure. She made a film called Being Enya. And uh, it's about that feeling of I'm not Latinx enough and I'm not American enough. I'm in this gray zone. Mm. Well, there are 16 million of those people in America. Did you have any idea? I had no idea. And I mean, certainly they deserve to have a podcast of their own. Why not? <laughs> right. They're dramatically underserved. So the yeah. Spanish speaking audience is is well served and growing. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the American audience, no question. But that that niche is dramatically underserved. And so mm-hmm. she's serving that niche. So knowing who you're talking to is amazingly helpful. Oh, yeah. But it's often very difficult. Yeah. And sometimes you don't discover it until you're halfway through. <laughs> oh, yeah. That can happen, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So those are, those are the three big questions to, mm-hmm. that we kick people off with. They are really good questions to ask. Yeah. Um, You mentioned um, in a previous discussion we had vision casting. Can you explain a little about that? Sure. Yeah. That's another term that it kind of fits into. I'm I'm assuming it fits into these questions and, you know, starting off and having an idea of what you're doing and why. (laughs) It absolutely does. It absolutely does. And I'm not a big one for acronyms, but it's just... You know, it's a helpful way to get your mind around a process. Mm-hmm. And uh, so so there are five P's to be, I just bumped the mic. So there are, <laughs> so there are five P's um, and they are plan, prep, practice, produce, and promote. And so, so we started Podcast Allies a little over a year ago, um, out of this feeling, and the name comes from that, that people didn't want to just learn online or learn however. They wanted their hands held mm. from idea to launch and beyond. So we came up with this process that really en- encompasses idea to launch, right? Mm-hmm. So the planning stage is what we just talked about. Yes. It's, what are you making? Who's it for and why? Uh, And then, of course, we go into much more detail. That can take a really long time. Hmm. Uh, A really long time. Um, I'm sure. If you're, I mean, if you're 
a big organization. It doesn't have to take a long time, but you want to be thorough about that process. Yeah, and I think the larger the organization, the harder it would be to move, <laughs> you know. It's true. Of- <laughs> you know, you have a lot more moving parts to get in, in line, yeah. <laughs> Although I'm impressed. Uh, our clients are are pretty efficient and they get it and um that's good uh, i'm pretty impressed but it's i mean of all things right it's the smaller you are the mm. more nimble you can be um mm-hmm. you know i as i said i was an editor at ink magazine so i'm i'm a huge fan <laughs> of the entrepreneur and i you know mm-hmm. I am one um sure so so there's that whole planning process and and you know for instance like with our target audience we want to know like what are they already listening to? What do they read? What do they watch? What do they go That's to? A good Who are they? Yeah. You know, what mm-hmm. tribes do they belong to, to? To use a bad term, what communities? Um, and uh, you know, what are some of the topics that you want to talk about? Uh, so that's all part of the planning process. And and we've done it like in whole days. In, you know, mm-hmm. intense sessions where you're writing on whiteboards and brainstorming together. And and we've done it virtually with questionnaires and conversations on zoom now and mm-hmm. you know so there's yep. different ways of doing it um and uh and then there's the prep which is uh, you and i talked about this in, a, in an earlier discussion what are the tangible things that you have to do before you can launch your podcast what are those show mm-hmm. assets you need to build so that's things like your title which is often very difficult your tagline, yeah. yeah. <laughs> your cover art, your logo, mm-hmm. um, and I believe and and or, creating an organizational home. It's kind of dweeby for all of that. Where's that all that audio going to live? Where's all mm-hmm. your? Because it's pretty easy once you start producing to get into a tangled mess of where your audio is, oh, especially yeah. if you're sharing it with an editor or mm-hmm. whomever, you know. So there's there's that. Um, and we have a we have a tip sheet on building your show assets. Um, and then there's producing. And, you know, in in audio land, it's often done in talked about in three stages, not these five stages. So you've got pre-production, production and post-production. Mm uh-huh. We're we're sort of you know you you could say that plan prep I I skipped over practice I apologize so our um, our early stages pre production falls in there where you're doing your research and you're figuring out your topics and you're booking guests and what or you're writing scripts if it's a reported podcast and sure. you know scripted podcast and so forth um, so our third piece is practice which. Depends on who it is, right? Some are new hosts. They need training. Uh, We're working with one client right now to help them audition hosts and select them. That's really fun, actually. I'm sure, yeah. Some exercises, yeah. (laughs) Um, And and in this case, it's co-hosted, so it's like, okay, you got to test them together. You can't just test them separately. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's some practice in there. And then the fourth step is producing, which, of course, is what we're doing right now. And we include post-production in there. So you'll yeah, all the post-production technical stuff. Um, and all of the stuff that you need to do to promote as well. So your social media and your visuals and how you're going to do show notes and transcripts. and That's huge. It's that is huge. seriously huge. Yeah. It, I mean, it is huge. When I started this, I had no idea how much, you know, promotion and post-production would be involved. <laughs> I had all the equipment. That wasn't the problem. I knew what I was doing when I was talking. But, you know, the rest of it, wow, there's so much that goes into this. There is so much more than most people realize when it's they so first true. start. Because it... I, I liken it to everybody thinks they're a writer because we all learned how to reading and write when we were five or six years old oh yeah and everyone always tells me oh i could do voiceover i can talk um 
It's a little more involved than that. (laughs) (laughs) And I can interview because I've been in conversations with people my entire life. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. yeah, I'm still learning. I'm still learning that. And I have to say that I actually have taken courses on this. Like there are actual courses out there for podcast interviewing. Um, Really? Yeah. 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 and I, I'm trying to remember the I can't remember the name of the guy. Um, but yeah, off the top of my head, I'm I'm drawing a blank here. But I know that there are such things out there. So mm-hmm. um, part of that, you know, part of my getting up to speed with this was taking one of those courses, so that, you know, it's it's active listening, yes, but it's also you know following the conversation and knowing what question will interest the you know the person you're talking to as well as your audience so it's kind of like a dual purpose yeah it's it's interesting it is interesting and I will say that even though I've probably done thousands of interviews over the course of my life between the print Mm -hmm. and the radio and the podcasting that I'm still learning I don't think you can ever stop learning good no interviewing and, yeah. and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, there is a fantastic, I always recommend this to people who want to learn more about interviewing. Mm-hmm. There's a fantastic podcast called The Turnaround. Okay. Um, Jesse Thorne, of Maximum, um, Maximum, I can't say this. I don't know <laughs> how he says it all the time. Mm-hmm. Maximum Fun. Okay. Which is a network. Mm-hmm. So Jesse Thorne partnered with the Columbia Journalism Review a couple of years ago to do the turnaround, which is interviews with the great interviewers. Wow. Well, I guess, you know, like who asks these people the questions, right? (laughs) And how they do it. And he admits like, and he's been interviewing all his life, I think. I don't know. And and he's like, oh, I'm doing this because I want to be better. And I'm hopelessly terrified talking to you, Terry Gross, (laughs) you know, and Ira Glass. Uh And even as Susan Orlean, the writer, uh, that was a really interesting interview, I thought. And um, uh, even Dick Cavett, if you, anybody remembers yeah. him. I wow. mean, there's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just, it's enlightening because, of course, everybody has their own style. So of course. Yeah. I need to go back and re-listen to that. <laughs> I'm going to seek that one out. That sounds interesting. <laughs> it is really, really, it's it's gripping. I could mm-hmm. not. Of course, you know, that's where my interest lies. So, Of course. This has been part one of our interview. I hope you'll tune in next week for part two. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, please take a moment to give the podcast a review. It's greatly appreciated and super helpful. Until next time.